On September 6, 2014, Agnes Clavina, a vibrant young woman, vanished into thin air after an evening of revelry at a prestigious nightclub. As the hours ticked by, the police would go on to launch a frantic investigation, and one by one, a trail of startling clues would begin to emerge. This is the case of 30-year-old Agnes Clavina. Agnes Clavina was born on July 8, 1984, in Riga, Latvia. She was welcomed as the second daughter to her mother and father, Daiga and Vladimir. Her sister, Gunta, was two years older than her. Growing up in Latvia, Agnes had a joyful childhood, receiving ample love from her family and forming a close bond with her sister. Agnes was described as a beautiful and extroverted young woman who loved going out and meeting new people. She enthusiastically filled her evenings with clubs and restaurants, reveling, responsibly as recalled by family members, in the pleasures of living life to the fullest. In her mid-twenties, Agnes made the life-altering choice to relocate from Latvia to London in search of better job opportunities. While living in London, Agnes met a businessman named Michael Millis in a London church. Michael, eight years Agnes's senior, was the former owner of Westbourne Studios in West London and immediately captivated her attention. Their connection deepened as they embarked on a romantic relationship. Those close to the couple remember the pair swiftly falling head over heels for one another. By all accounts, life was good for Agnes. She not only discovered new employment opportunities in London, but had also seemingly found love. In 2014, Agnes was thrilled to receive a three-month contract offer as a receptionist in a luxury club called the Ocean Club in Marbella, Spain. Marbella is one of the most popular holiday destinations in Spain, with its delightful year-round temperate climate, stunning beaches, and a lively nightlife it has captivated tourists from all over the world. Marbella holds a special appeal for the affluent, with luxury resorts known to draw in countless rich and famous guests as their preferred getaway. Such extravagance was precisely what attracted Agnes to the area, and she eagerly accepted the job offer. In 2014, she made the solo move to Marbella, leaving her boyfriend, Michael, behind in London. While she would be moving alone, the two decided to continue their relationship despite the distance. Agnes frequently visited her family in Latvia, and when she shared the news of her move to Spain with them, she received their unwavering support. Her friends and family maintained regular contact with Agnes, offering their encouragement and staying connected, be it through social media or by telephone. Actively engaged on social media, Agnes frequently shared numerous photos documenting her arrival and experiences in Spain. Through these frequent posts, it was evident that the young woman was enjoying her life in the city. She had made several friends and loved her job. After completing her three-month contract at the Ocean Club, Agnes got another job as a waitress at a restaurant called Guay. On September 6, 2014, Agnes went to a renowned nightclub called Aqua Mist, situated in Puerto Banus, Nueva Andalusia. Aqua Mist was known to be a popular club where the well-known and the wealthy would choose to party. Those in attendance that night recall Agnes was wearing a beautiful, multicolored halter dress and carrying a large white Louis Vuitton handbag. Her friends would go on to photograph the night, as they usually did, and the last photo of Agnes ever taken shows her in her pink and blue dress, smiling at the camera with her drink in hand. At around 3 a.m., her friends began to feel tired and decided to leave. However, they recall Agnes saying she wanted to stay a while longer and that she would take a taxi back on her own. She told them not to worry and bid them farewell. The group noticed Agnes, ever the social butterfly, had been conversing with a woman who appeared to be of Russian descent. 
The friends themselves did not know the identity of the woman, nor any further details about her. However, they assumed Agnes was making yet another local connection, and thought nothing of the friendly interaction. The mental image of Agnes talking and smiling away at the club would be the last image the friends ever had of her, as she would never be seen again. A few days later, Agnes's family became concerned, as they had tried contacting her, but her phone was unreachable. Such a lack of communication was highly unusual for the family-oriented young woman. Moreover, friends and family noticed that Agnes, typically very active on social media, had not made any posts nor updates for days. Once family members spoke to one another, they realized that Agnes had also not replied to any of her online messages. Concerned about her well-being, her boyfriend called the Spanish police to report Agnes missing. However, the Spanish police, frustratingly, told him that he had to file a report in person, and he was still in London. Because such a lack of communication was highly unusual, Michael, Agnes's sister, Gunta, and Agnes's mother, Daiga, decided to personally travel to Marbella. The group arrived on the 11th of September, five days after Agnes disappeared. Upon landing in the locale in which the 30-year-old had gone missing, the group of concerned family members and her boyfriend traveled together to report Agnes missing at the police station and began to organize their own search. When they arrived at Agnes's apartment, they discovered that everything seemed to be in its proper order. There were no indications of forced entry, and the missing woman's bank cards, clothes, and personal belongings were all present and accounted for inside the apartment, suggesting that Agnes had left the apartment voluntarily, with the intention of eventually coming back. The Marbella Police Department launched an investigation into the disappearance, while her family members put up missing persons posters throughout the city, urging anyone with information to go to police. Media reports detail that the Spanish police took four days to investigate the last place that Agnes was seen, the club Aqua Mist. By that time, the CCTV recordings from that specific day were already deleted. Fortunately, after the police took possession of the hard drive, they were able to recover the footage. The surveillance footage from the club proved to be essential in the investigation. Upon analyzing the video footage, investigators made a distressing discovery. They witnessed Agnes Clavina at approximately 6 a.m. exiting the nightclub in the company of a man. She and the man engaged in a conversation outside of the club's entrance, as seen on CCTV footage, and detectives noted that Agnes appeared visibly agitated throughout the entire interaction. The man seemed insistent, and it was evident that Agnes desired to break free from his grip. Startlingly, the man tightly held Agnes's wrist and proceeded to guide her towards his car, a Mercedes S63 AMG with tinted windows. He placed his hand around her waist, coercing her inside the vehicle where another man was already sitting. after which the man seems to tip the doorman. Looking closely at the footage, detectives noticed that Agnes was trying to escape the vehicle by opening the door of the car. However, the man asks the club's doorman to shut her door. These haunting images were presumed to be the final recorded moment of Agnes Clavina out in the world.
it was found that Agnes had used her phone for a duration of 14 minutes. Specifically, she had done so six minutes after leaving the club. Approximately five hours after she was last seen at Aquamist, her mobile phone stopped transmitting any signal. Her social media accounts, which she regularly utilized, have remained untouched since that fateful night. The investigating magistrate assigned to Agnes's disappearance placed a secrecy order on the case, preventing public employees, including police, from making any official comment. For months, the family of Agnes received very little information about the case. Days, weeks, and months passed by, but the family received no updates about Agnes, leaving them in a state of uncertainty and distress. Agnes's boyfriend, Michael, said to the Daily Mail, quote, The longer Agnes is missing, the more pessimistic we are about ever seeing her alive again. I think if she was going to be found safe and well, she would have contacted someone close to her by now, and she hasn't. It would take seven months before the family would receive any information about Agnes. When the secrecy order was finally lifted, they were informed about the existence of the CCTV footage which captured the three individuals interacting with Agnes the night she went missing. The man seen talking to Agnes, trying to get her to come with him, was identified as 37-year-old Wesley Capper. Wesley happened to be the son of John Capper, a wealthy British property developer known for his expertise in dealing with luxury real estate worldwide. The man already present inside the car was recognized as 33-year-old Greg Porter, who was a friend of Wesley, while the individual working as a doorman was identified as a newsman. Wesley and Craig were interviewed extensively, seeking explanations for their actions, which were captured on the CCTV. Wesley and Craig claimed they were innocent, asserting that Agnes willingly entered their vehicle and that they did not force her. They initially claimed to have simply interacted with her after she had indicated she wanted to be dropped off at her apartment. However, Wesley further explained that both men spent the entire evening at the Aquamist nightclub and quickly had noticed Agnes, approached her and extended an invitation to continue the party on at one of the men's houses, which was on an upmarket residential estate 20 minutes from the club. The man told police that Agnes had accepted the offer to the private party. He claimed that it was Agnes who later changed her mind while driving in the car and requested to be dropped off at a specific roundabout in an area which had poor lighting and no sidewalks. Craig, on the other hand, told police that he had been sleeping in the backseat of the car due to his intoxication and was therefore unaware of the moment that Agnes disembarked from the vehicle. The police found Agnes's request to be dropped off in a poorly lit non-residential area, a 40-minute walk from her own home, quite suspicious. Wesley and Craig's statement of events did not seem to make sense, raising further questions. The doorman, Sinu Usman, was also questioned and told police that he was instructed by his boss to remove Craig and Wesley from the club due to their disruptive behavior. He clarified that Agnes never sought his help and that he was unaware of the danger she was in. He believed she was leaving voluntarily with the two men and said that he had only closed the car door in hopes of receiving a tip. Investigators would soon find another perplexing discovery when analyzing a second set of video surveillance footage. However, unlike the first CCTV recording, this particular footage was never made available to the public. The footage was from the harbor in Puerto de la Duquesa, taken just four days after Agnes's disappearance, just before she was officially reported missing. In the footage, Wesley and Craig can be seen accompanied by two unidentified individuals. They are seen boarding a motorboat, carrying a large suitcase and a carpet. The boat was found to belong to Wesley Capper. Upon questioning, Wesley claimed that the suitcase contained clothes and that the carpet was not a carpet at all, but bedding, as they had been planning on going to Ibiza with their friends for a few days of partying. 
The boat was later found docked in Cartagena, Spain, about 452 kilometers from Marbella. The police seized the boat and conducted a forensic analysis. They found traces of DNA. However, a DNA test determined that it was not Agnes's DNA. Additionally, police had conducted forensic analysis of Wesley's Mercedes car and had found a blonde hair in the trunk. Unfortunately, it was not possible to determine the origin by comparing them to hair samples collected from Agnes's hairbrush. Upon examination of Wesley's phone, authorities discovered that several concerning calls were made on the night of Agnes's disappearance. Records indicate that Wesley attempted to contact emergency services multiple times, but each time he hung up. Furthermore, his mobile phone registered 14 calls made to his friend named Paul Farmer between 6.23 a.m. and 6.38 a.m., followed by additional calls later that morning. These calls occurred just 30 minutes after Agnes was last seen on CCTV footage getting into their vehicle. When confronted about these calls, Wesley tried to justify them. He claimed that the calls to emergency services were accidental and that he had contacted his friend Paul Farmer in order to purchase drugs. However, when questioned, Paul Farmer refused to provide any further information regarding the reasons behind the calls. Later, the family's lawyer, in an interview, said that Agnes, they believe, is no longer alive and that he believes her body is in the depths of the ocean. He further said that the perpetrators had ample time to destroy any evidence, considering that Agnes was not even reported officially missing until September 11th, 2014, five days after her actual disappearance. He cites the unwillingness of the police in Marbella to cooperate with families from out of town. After over 18 months of investigation, both Wesley Capper and Craig Porter were formally charged with aggravated unlawful detention, a charge which took into account the evidence from the CCTV footage. Wesley and Craig were released on bail, awaiting their trial after paying the necessary amount of money. Nevertheless, they were subjected to travel restrictions and prohibited from leaving Spain until the conclusion of the trial. Agnes's family protested that the two men should not be free and should be locked up until the trial, but a judge rejected their appeal. In 2017, Greg Porter was granted permission to return to England for the birth of his child. Agnes's family voiced their objections to this decision due to concerns that he may not choose to return to Spain in order to evade the trial. Craig would eventually return to face trial. The case would be brought in front of a judge beginning in March of 2019, four years after Agnes went missing. All three men, Wesley Capper, Craig Porter, and Sanai Usman, appeared in court. All three pleaded not guilty and maintained the same version of events. Wesley admitted to drinking beer and vodka and to taking drugs that night but he insisted under oath that Agnes had gotten into his car willingly after they'd met in the club. He said that he was holding her by the waist as they left Aquamist because she was, quote, drunk and staggering. Prosecutors alleged that it was evident from the footage that the men had taken advantage of Agnes's intoxicated state in order to coerce her into the car against her will. They further said that the doorman should be considered an accomplice in the unlawful detention, as he had closed the back door when Agnes attempted to leave. This charge potentially carried a sentence of four years in prison. The prosecution sought a sentence of 12 years for both Wesley and Craig, along with the compensation amounting to 75,000 euros for the family of Agnes. Prosecutors said that Wesley should be given a harsher penalty as they believe he had made Agnes enter his vehicle, quote, against her will in the initial offense and had further aggravated the crime by instructing the club doorman to close the door when she attempted to exit. They further added that the separate CCTV footage taken four days later, showing a carpet and a suitcase being taken aboard a boat by four men, including the two defendants, was not necessarily proof Agnes was dead, but helped, quote, shape an odd picture that might explain why she had disappeared. 
The defense argued, quote, The only evidence that is undisputed is that Agnes Clavina left the nightclub and got into a car driven by my client, which Craig Porter was a passenger in. The rest is conjecture and speculation. According to the defense lawyer, the CCTV footage only demonstrated Wesley's attempt to convince Agnes to enter the car, and he emphasized that she willingly chose to get into the vehicle. Additionally, the lawyer argued that the 14-minute phone usage, occurring six minutes after Agnes left the club, could be attributed to a WhatsApp call she potentially made to a friend requesting to be picked up along a road. During the time after she exited the vehicle, it is suggested by defense lawyers that a third, unidentified individual may have noticed the 30-year-old while she waited on the road. The defense attorney representing the club's doorman stated in court that his client was innocent and should not be convicted. Media reports stress that the doorman was solely prosecuted by the lawyers representing Agnes's family and not by the state prosecutors, as in the case of the two men who forced her into the car. The doorman, who hails from Cameroon, was the only one among the three defendants who chose to deliver a final statement to the court from the witness stand before the judges withdrew to deliberate on their verdict. During his speech, he described Agnes as a frequent patron of the nightclub. He also told the court that he had come to Spain from his homeland of Africa just to earn a living and to help his family, who was starving. He also suggested that he may be on trial because of the color of his skin or the origin of his citizenship. Weeks later, the verdict was delivered, declaring Wesley Capper and Craig Porter not guilty of unlawful detention. The judge determined that Wesley did not force Agnes into his car. Instead, Wesley was convicted of a lesser crime, coercion, relating to the way that he got, quote, drunk Agnes to leave with him, and he was handed a two-year prison sentence. Craig was sentenced to six months for being an accomplice. In addition, each was ordered to pay 10,000 euros compensation to Agnes Clavina's family. The doorman, on the other hand, was cleared of all charges. However, despite the sentence, Wesley and Craig did not face any prison time for Agnes's disappearance, as under Spanish law, sentences of two years or less for first-time offenders are normally suspended. The family of Agnes was highly dissatisfied and appealed in Supreme Court. Media reports note that Wesley and Craig were involved in another case while awaiting trial for Agnes's, this time for a hit and run. On May 9, 2016, one month after the duo was charged with Agnes's disappearance, Wesley was driving at a high speed under the influence of alcohol and drugs. He struck a woman from Bolivia named Fatima Dorado Para. She had been in the marked pedestrian crossing in the town of San Pedro de Alcantara, near Marbella, around 8 p.m. However, Wesley did not stop, but instead went to an Indian restaurant as if nothing had happened. Fatima was taken to the hospital, but died a few hours later. After her tragic demise, her husband, in a state of disbelief, shared about how generous she was. He revealed that Fatima used to send hundreds of pounds back to her hometown of Santa Cruz in Bolivia every month in order to support the education of her teenage children, Sebastian and Carla. Wesley was arrested after witnesses recognized his Bentley. He confessed to killing Fatima in the hit and run and was remanded in jail after appearing in court the following day. Wesley stood trial for the hit-and-run case and was found guilty and sentenced to only a two-year suspended sentence, which meant that he would not be put behind bars. Craig was, however, allowed to walk free completely. Some speculate that the lenient sentence was due to his substantial financial compensation to the victim's family. It was found that Wesley had paid £8,500 to the family of his victim, as well as £950 a month since the accident. One month after the trial for Agnes was over, Craig was arrested, again, this time for carjacking. Reportedly, Craig and another one of his friends had forced two people into a vehicle at knife point and had assaulted them. The vehicle was later found burnt out, discovered on desolate land near the Costa de Sol vacation town. 
Both men had to jump out of the moving vehicle after they were beaten and hit with beer bottles by Craig. Craig and his friend, who already had an arrest warrant under his name in the UK, were subsequently detained. While Craig's friend was extradited to the UK, it is unclear if Craig actually received any criminal sentence. On July 26, 2021, unfortunately, Wesley Capper died of a stroke caused by COVID-19 at the age of 44 in a Spanish hospital. His death means that even if the Spanish Supreme Court were to overturn the initial decision in the case of Agnes, he cannot be held legally accountable. No trace of Agnes nor her body has ever been found, leaving her family and loved ones to forever yearn for truth and closure. 